So we are continuing our lesson on consolidated financial statement. In this lesson, we will be looking at the standard IFRS 10, that is the National Financial Reporting Standard 10 Consolidated Financial Statement, which outline the key principles, the procedures in how to prepare and present your consolidated financial statement. As stated in our previous videos on consolidation, that IFRS 3 and IFRS 10 complement each other in the preparation and presentation of consolidated financial statement. But the key or the main standard that's prescribed or that outline the procedures for which an entity is supposed to prepare consolidated financial statement is International Financial Reporting Standard 10, that is Consolidated Financial Statement. And that's what we are going to go extensively into in this particular consolidation or group accounts lesson. So, IFRS 10, Consolidated Financial Statement. Now, what's the objective of IFRS 10? The objective of IFRS 10 is to set out the principle and the concept that governs the preparation and presentation of consolidated financial statement. The objective is to set out the principle or the concept that governs the preparation and presentation of what financial statement. Now, when we talk about consolidated financial statement, we have um, introduction lesson on this particular topic already explaining some key terms or some key concepts but in this we are going to go over them again to establish or augment a better understanding on, on what we are going to do today now from the objective we realize that an entity is required to prepare a consolidated financial statement after meeting certain criteria by the end of this lesson you will know which criteria or which requirement is needed by an entity before that entity is supposed to prepare a consolidated financial statement. So from here, from the objective, you want to look at what is um, group. So definition of key terms. When we talk about consolidated financial statements, we are basically looking at a statement that shows um, the combination of two statements combined together presented as a single financial statement. So an entity acquires another entity and then the, the entity prepares one statement for these two entities. That is what we, we say consolidated financial statement. Remember that when we say financial statement, we are not making reference to only statement of financial position, but we are making reference to all statements prepared by the entity. So we have from the beginning, from income statement to statement of comprehensive income. We also have the statement of changes in equity. We are also looking at statement of financial position as well as the cash flow statement. So all these statements combined, we call it consolidated financial statement. So a parent or an entity which has acquired another entity, how or what procedures, what um, process is this entity supposed to go through to prepare these st consolidated financial statements that is all we are going to look at in today's video looking at everything that you are supposed to know to answer practical questions in any exam situation and also understand the concept in any organization you find yourself that you can practice okay so just a recap on what we've done in our introduction lesson we said that a group is basically a parent plus subsidiaries. So we can have just one parent with subsidiary. This means that if you don't have um, understanding on this principle, you can go to our previous lessons and we have a video or a lesson on this um, concept. Group, a parent and a who is a subsidiary and what acquisition give rise to a parent, what acquisition give rise to associates, which also give rise to um, joint arrangement. All right, so we say a group is a parent plus subsidiary. So here that means we can have one parent 
but you can have we have to have more than one or we can have more than one subsidiaries now what do we say a group if under normal circumstances when we take strict legal um, considerations or circumstances you will see that this entity and this entity a subsidiary and a parent exist separately they exist as a separate legal entity but when when it comes to what you call economic substance economic substance the parent and the group are seen to be one one single economic entity but under legal you know considerations or under legal a strict legal concept you will see this parent as a separate entity see this parent as a separate entity but once this parent has obtained control over this entity then we see that we see these two entities as a single economic entity that is what we say group so group is made up of a parent and one or more subsidiaries that is a group now who who then is a parent and who then is a subsidiary who then is a parent and who then is a subsidiary parent also known as investor also known as an acquirer so the parent is also known as investor it's also known as an acquirer is an entity that controls another entity or an entity that obtains control over another entity so anytime a, an entity let's say a obtained controlled obtain control over b limited then we say a is the parent uh, the parent entity of b so anytime an entity obtains control over another entity then we say there is what a is of uh, controlling b or b is a subsidiary to a and a is the parent to um, b then this brings us to the concept of subsidiary subsidiary an entity which is being controlled by another entity is called a subsidiary so from these two definitions we can see the key term there which is what control in fact when it comes to control in consolidated financial statement is very very important because it is the control that tells us whether the entity is supposed to what prepare consolidated financial statement or not control is the basic requirement or criteria for which one entity is supposed to prepare its consolidated financial statement how then do we determine control and what is control now let's go deeply into the term control now what is control we said a control is when an investor or an investor obtains control when that investor is exposed to so first when that investor is exposed to or has the right has the right to the variable returns from its involvement with the investee so it's exposed to or has the right to the variable returns from its involvement with the investee and has the power so this is the first one the second one is that has the power to affect the returns of the investee Okay, has the power or has the ability to affect the returns of the investee through its exercise of what of power so basically when we talk about control we are saying that the investor is exposed to or has the right to the variable returns from the invest uh, from the involvement with the investee which is the subsidiary and then this parent you know the investor is the same as the parent is having the ability to what to influence or affect the returns of the investee anytime such scenarios or such circumstances happen then we say there is a control so this looks a bit complicated so when you're giving a question how do you establish this control it looks a bit complicated now under normal circumstances and under almost all practical exam circumstances 
Control exists when the entity acquires 50% plus of the equity shares of the equity shares in another entity. Remember that these equity shares can also be known as voting rights. Voting rights. So, under normal circumstances, or in almost all circumstances, we say that an entity obtains control over another entity when that entity obtains 50% voting rights or equity shares of the other entity. All right. So, practical example. If a PLC acquires 80% of the equity shares in B PLC, we say that A PLC has obtained control over B PLC because of what the acquisition of 80% equity shares in B PLC. An acquisition can also be um, so here if A PLC is acquiring 80% of B PLC, then the remaining 20% goes to non-controlling interest. We've explained this under IFRS 3, that is business con combination, what NCI is, and then how to value NCI. So a quick recap, what is NCI? We are saying that is the equity interest in the subsidiary, which is not directly or indirectly attributable to, what, to the parent. The equity interest in the subsidiary does not belong to what, the parent, either directly or indirectly. We have two ways of measuring the NCI. Either we use the fair value method or we use the proportionate share. We have a video or a lesson on it that is on a business combination. So if you don't have that, you can quickly um, look at the channel and then watch it for your perusal. Now, so there are some time that an entity or a parent entity can take control and buy 100% of the equity shares of another entity. If that's the case, then, then NCI holdings will be zero. So control exists when an entity acquires 50% plus equity shares of voting rights in another entity. That means we are saying that the entity making the acquisition obtain control over the other entity. So in this instance, A becomes the parent and then B, B or C becomes a subsidiary. Now, there are some times that A PLC will acquire 80% equity shares in B PLC. Then B PLC also acquires 60% equity shares in C PLC. Now, A is having interest in B PLC. B is also having interest in C PLC. Indirectly, we say that A controls or has control over C. We call C will be sub subsidiary to A. So whilst B, B or C is subsidiary to A, C becomes a sub subsidiary to, or to A. Because of the acquisition in B, B also have an acquisition in C, A indirectly controls C. That is another form of control. Now, aside all these normal or general um, criteria for which we can determine control, there is an exception. And this exception, we call it de facto the facto or we call it in fact or in real terms okay now these exceptions comes in two forms there are sometimes that the entity will acquire below 50 percent equity share that means the entity does cannot obtain control because the entity is acquiring below 50 percent equity shares of voting rights in the other entity but there are some circumstances Although the entity will be acquiring below the 50% equity shares in another entity, that entity will still obtain control. And that is the exceptions or the circumstances we want to look at now. So, under two circumstances, an entity will acquire less than the 50% equity shares in another entity, but again will obtain control. So, let's again say APLC acquires 45% equity shares in B PLC. So under normal circumstances, this does not give rise to what? To control. But let's, there is this clause that the remaining shares or the, re, the remaining equity shares is hold or subscribed to by a large number of unrelated investors whose shares does not 
um, is not more than one percent. So if the entity acquires below the fifty percent, but the other MCI, the other investors, their holdings is not is insignificant. Let's say the rest of the fifty five percent is held by fifty five investors. Everybody is having one 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 percent. Then indirectly, the entity acquiring the forty five percent is having control over the entity. So the first exception is that when the entity acquires below 50% equity shares, but the remaining shares is being subscribed to by unrelated, a large number of unrelated investors whose shares does not amount to more than 1% of the shares. In other words, their share, you know, um, <clears throat> their share holdings is insignificant. That is the first instance. The second instance is that the entity will still obtain something lesser than the 50%, but agrees or partner with another entity to obtain control. So here, let's say A, PLC, has 40% equity interest in B, PLC. And then A Bank also has 20% equity shares in B, PLC. Now A agrees to give its voting rights to A. So this is an agreement. So this agreement makes the holdings of A to be 60%, therefore est uh, establishing what control over B. So the second one is that when there is an agreement between two investors, this is not joint arrangement, but just an, 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 an agreement to one of the holdings to give the voting rights to another entity, which gives the one receiving the rights to obtain control so this is where agreement and this is when the holdings of other investors are insignificant so under these two circumstances we will say the entity what will still obtain control even though the entity is acquiring below 50 percent equity shares having established our understanding on how to obtain control when is an entity required to prepare consolidated financial statements we are saying that an entity is required to prepare a consolidated financial statement when the entity has obtained what control has established earlier but there are some exceptions there are some exceptions that an entity may con obtain control but will not be allowed to prepare a consolidated financial statement there are exceptions for which the entity will, hold, will still obtain control but will not be allowed to, hold, to prepare consolidated financial statements. So when that entity or when the parent is partially or wholly owned subsidiary, so when the parent is partially or wholly owned subsidiary, then they are not allowed to hold, prepare consolidated financial statements. Two, when you don't trade your equity and debt security, so your equity capital and debt capital in the public market, when you don't trade such instruments in the public market, you are not allowed to prepare consolidated financial statements. The third one is that when the entity is not in the process of filing or does not file its financial statement with the security commission. So if you're an entity, Although you have obtained control, but you don't file or you are not in the process of filing your financial statement with the security commission, then you are not allowed to, what, to prepare consolidated financial statement. And the fourth one is that, that when the ultimate parent prepares consolidated financial statement, that is in accordance with all IFRSs and it is being in use, then such an entity is not supposed to what prepare a consolidated financial statement. So although an entity is supposed to prepare a consolidated financial statement, there are some few exceptions for which you can still obtain that control, but you are not allowed to what, prepare consolidated financial statement. Having understand these exceptions, we want to now go deeply into the process of consolidation. Remember that the standard IFRS 10 prescribed the process of consolidation. Now, if one want to consolidate, this is the process. The first procedure is that you have to determine 
your control structure. You determine your control structure. Control structure. This is when you determine the amount of holdings or, or the percentage of acquisition the parent is obtaining over the what the subsidiary. So you have, is it eighty percent? Is it twenty percent? So the amount of what percentage that the sorry it cannot be twenty percent. Is it sixty percent? So the amount of holdings the entity is what is acquiring in the subsidiary. How do we determine that? Sometimes questions will be so straightforward. They will give you the percentage acquired. If the percentage is not given to you, they will give you the number of shares acquired. So assuming that APLC acquires 60,000 shares in BPLC. And then BPLC total shares is 80,000 shares. For you to determine your control is basically your 60,000 the number of shares acquired divided by the total number of the subsidiary or multiplied by 100 will give you the control over the subsidiary. But most instances, they give you the percentage straightforward. But if not given, is the shares acquired and then divided by the total number of shares holding of the subsidiary. After determining your control structure, you have to determine or calculate for your goodwill. That is what we call um, cost of control, cost of control. Remember that in preparation of your cost, cost of control, there are two things involved there. If NCI is, how NCI is valued affects your goodwill. Remember that if NCI is valued at fair value, then NCI will partake in the goodwill. And therefore, the fair value must be added to the cost of investment before you determine your goodwill. But if NCI is valued at the proportionate share, then NCI does not partake in goodwill. It must not partake in anything affecting goodwill. So we take a particular question and so we look at that. The third one, after determining your goodwill, you then go ahead to calculate for your retained earnings. Uh, in fact, group retained earnings. You calculate for group retained earnings. So this is where you have to compute for your group retained earnings. It follows some procedure. We take a question and we look at how it goes into it. Remember that you want to look at, first we are looking at consolidated statement of financial position. You look at the balance sheet first. When we are done, then we look at the income statement before the cash flow statement. And we also we may also look at the statement of changes in equity, how to consolidate such a statement. But in this example, we are going to look at a consolidated statement of financial position, also previously known as the balance sheet. That's what we are going to look at, consolidated statement of financial position. Our focus is first on consolidated statement of financial position. Then after determining your group retain earnings, you calculate for your NCI holdings. So you determine your NCI holdings. So after you determine your NCI holding, and then you can prepare your statement of what your consolidated or group statement of financial position. How do we prepare our group statement of financial position? So here the cost they will give you the separate financial statement of the both the parent and then what the subsidiary separate one. So here you are supposed to what merge them or prepare consolidated financial statement by adding like items, eliminating intra-group transactions, and then accounting for what we call unrealized profit. So we are going to take our first example, but after that, we will go deeply into what we call purchase consideration. Purchase consideration. This is the amount that the acquirer or the parent pays for acquiring the subsidiary. It comes in different form. It can be by cash, it can be by share exchange, it can be by loan notes issued, it can be by deferred payment. So you look at that later on. We also look at what we call um, intra-group transactions, how to eliminate non-current intra-group transactions, inventory or current asset intra-group transactions, and other 
relevant information in our subsequent lesson on consolidation. But in this lesson, we are just basically looking at simple consolidated financial statements. In that, I suppose to then add your like items. So the asset column of the entity A and entity B, you add them together in the group account. The liability, you add lines and uh, line by line items, and you eliminate what the intra group transactions in case there is one. Now remember that anytime the entity acquires another entity in the separate financial statement of the parent, there will be this clause: the investment in B. That amount will be there in the preparation of the consolidated financial statement. That amount must be eliminated. So another source of which you can get the amount paid to the subsidiary as an amount of acquisition can be found in the what in the statement of another position of the parent, the acquirer, the investor. You can find that amount there. But remember that when you are preparing your group or consolidated statement of financial position for the group, you must learn that investment what amount from the uh, account. Okay, so having understand this simple principle, you want to use the radical question to augment or establish our understanding. So the question will be at the video description. So once you click on the, the link at the video description, you'll get access to the full question and the solution in the video. Now, in the question, we're told that P acquired 70%. Let's go to the question first. P acquired 70% of X on 1st January 2021 for $450,000. And then the retained earnings of X were $50,000 at that date. So on the date of the acquisition, they had a retained earnings of $50,000. It is the policy of P to recognize non-controlling interest at the date of acquisition as a at what as a proportionate share of net assets so now ncr is valued at a proportionate share but not fair value so how you determine your goodwill will differ then they have been given the statement of financial position for the period so we have the investment in x at cost of 450 we have that of x over there we have other assets we have equity we have retained earnings we have current liabilities and then we have share capital for both. And then the question is, we should prepare consolidated statement of financial position after the fair December 2021. That is the requirement. Now, so going through the process, the first thing is we have to determine our what our um, control structure. So here we have P limited having 70% interest so they said they have acquired 70 percent interest in what in s limited but before then before then there is something very very important anytime you have a consolidated financial questions in your presence first determine the acquisition date and determine the reporting date before you start any calculation please this is a trick determine the what the acquisition date and the reporting date before you start any calculation make sure you have those two dates before you start any calculation. So here we have the acquisition date, the day on which the entity is acquiring the other assets to be um, 1st of January 2021. And then the reporting date, the reporting date is 31st of December 2021. So you can see that between the dates of acquisition and the date of reporting is just one year or 12 months interval so we don't have any too much issue when it is less than the one year then we have to pro rata certain figures on uh, evenly on a monthly basis we will look at certain questions like that subsequently so here p limited in s is 70 percent and then nci holdings nci holdings are taking what 30 percent if the parent are acquiring 70 percent then nci is taking 30 percent now let's determine our goodwill so cost of control we call it cost of control or determination of what goodwill now the first thing that comes is your investment cost or purchase consideration 
Petty's consideration. Let's have our dollar sign over here. We can take the three zeros up. So Petty's consideration. And then in the question, we were told that for they acquired 70% for $450,000. The next question is, ask yourself, how is NCI valued? In the question, NCI was valued at the proportionate share. If NCI were to be valued at fair value, then we would have added the fair value of the NCI to this. So it would have been NCI, fair value. We added the figure over here. But in the question, NCI was valued at the proportionate share, for which they don't partake in goodwill. So nothing about goodwill affect them. So they are not supposed to appear in the computation of what of your goodwill. Then we now go to net wet taking over or net asset taking over. And here we bring everything that happened at the date of acquisition, all the assets of the what the net asset of the subsidiary at the date of what acquisition. Please, the net asset of what of the subsidiary at the date of acquisition is now brought here. Then we take the percentage we have acquired to deduct from this one to get our good. Remember that the amount you paid less the net asset gives us what the good rule. So here, there are two ways of doing this. Is either you straightly bring your net asset, uh, sorry, the acquisition date asset here line by line, or you go and determine the total and you bring the total here. There are two ways. So I'm going to do the two ways, then you select one. So here in the book or in the question, we have what you call share capital. Share capital. So on our acquisition date, the share capital is 100. So let's have our dollar sign here. Maybe the reporting dates also have it here so it is hundred hundred so the difference is negative do we have share premium so the other thing that we can see is share premium but in this question there's no share premium so it will be dash dash then you can ask yourself do you have what you call retain earnings retain earnings yes we have on the acquisition date it is fifty thousand is 50,000 and then on the reporting date it is 100,000. This is for this is solely for the subsidiary. This is solely for the subsidiary. Is that okay? So the share capital is the same at the acquisition date and is the same as what well at the reporting date. So the acquisition date is 50,000 but the reporting date is 100,000. That means the they made additional 50,000 after they have acquired the business. So the group will take or partake in post acquisition profit, and then the next thing we can have here is revaluation surplus. Revaluation surplus. Revaluation surplus. Here, we don't have one in the question, so there is no revaluation surplus. If you add these two, so since we've we've taken three zeros up, let's take three zeros up. Let's take so it will be hundred and fifty. So this will this one will be one fifty, and this will be two hundred. So this is a reporting date asset, net asset, and this is the acquisition date what net asset. So this is how to determine this. Then when you are done, you bring your net asset here. So net asset is going to be the 150 multiplied by 70%. Why are we taking 70%? We are taking 70% because the entity or the NCI is not valued at fair value. So you don't partake in good rule. So you have to take the percentage you have acquired of the net asset. The Group only has 70% interest in the net asset of the subsidiary. The rest belongs to what? To the NCI, of which they don't partake in good, so they must not come here. The other way is that instead of you going to this preparation of your net asset, you bring the first item, your share capital. Remember, it should be the it should be the acquisition date share capital, not the reporting date share capital. So it is 100 over here. So if you take 100 by 70%, then you bring your retained earnings. In case there was a share premium, in case there was a revaluation surplus at the acquisition date, you bring all of them over here separately. So here is going to be uh, retained earnings. So retained earnings here is going to be 50 multiplied by 70%. At the end of the day, your answers, whatever you get here, will be the same if you sum up these two. So 
it depends on you to choose which of the two methods you prefer to use in your calculation either you go for this or you go for this one all right so this if you do this correctly, you get 105 so this is the net asset we take it from this one to get a goodwill a goodwill of um, three four five three four five so these are good wool. in case there is an impairment in the person we would have left the impairment for me to get a final good wool. so this is how to determine your cost of control or this is how to determine your good wool. and that way is that if nci were to be valued at fair value we would have added the nci value to it and here we wouldn't have taken any percent because nci takes 30 percent and the 30 percent for the 72 gives us 100 so we wouldn't have taken any percentage of this 150 so assuming that NCI is valued at fair value, which is 50, we would have added this one. And when we come, we would have, I mean, bring all the 150. That is when NCI is what is fair value. But in this case, NCI was what was um, valued at the proportionate shares. So therefore, we have to take the percentage of only the payment. So having established our goodwill to be 3, 4, 5, now we can go ahead and determine our what our group retained earnings or group income stop loss. So here we have our group retained earnings over here. So this is our currency sign. So group retained earnings. So first we bring the balance, the balance of um, brought forward or carry forward. Carry forward, or we can say, brought down of the parent. Please, the parent, the balance brought forward of the retained earnings of the parent, the parent, not the subsidiary. The balance brought down of the retained earnings of what of the parent. That is the one in the balance sheet. So, with the balance sheet we have in the question, the retained earnings for the parent is six fifty. Six fifty. Now we bring post acquisition movement. Post acquisition movement. Now. Any profit the entity generates after the acquisition, the parent must partake in it. That is what you mean by post acquisition movement in profit. So, post acquisition movement in profit. In profit. Post acquisition movement in profit. And here, this is what we do. There are two ways of doing it. When we calculated the net asset, the difference between the retained earnings was 50 because we have the opening to be the uh, the acquisition date to be 50, the reporting date to be what 100. So the difference gives us 50. So it's either you bring the 50 years straight away, or you take the reporting date value, which was 100 in this case, then we less the acquisition date value before we take the percentage of what of acquisition. So it's either you do what we did under the net assets to get this, or you bring the reporting dates um, within and in of the subsidiary, of the subsidiary here, of the subsidiary, and then we less the what the 50, which is the acquisition date what within and is before we take our percentage of it. In this case, it's going to be 50 multiplied by 30, which is going to uh, multiply by 70%, which is going to give us. 35. Now, there are certain things that may come here subsequently when we go further. This is just the basic, so I wouldn't want to bring a lot of things. If there is finance cost of which we are, we have a purchase deferred consideration, we will bring it here as an expense. If there is to be an impairment and then it's only goodwill, so it's only the payment that is enjoying the goodwill, then all the impairments will be being brought here. If there is any um, what's the name, any depreciation of which we are not asked to prepare income statement, it will be brought here as an expense. Anything we would have done in the income statement, and of which the question is asked us to prepare income statement, but on the dated statement of financial position, that expense will be done here. Anything we would have done in the income statement would be done under the group within earnings. If it's an expense, be less. If it's a profit or income, we add up. So here, in this case, we are going to have. 685 as our group within earnings. Then the next thing is to determine our NCI holdings. NCI holdings. 
NCI holdings. All right. So since NCI didn't partake in the good role in the what's the name in the net asset, the thirty percent here must be brought here before the what the post acquisition was profit. So here you have our net asset here brought first. So net assets asset first, which was the one. 150 multiplied by 30 percent so this will give us so as we have done over here so this will give us 45 so as you you've taken 70 percent of this one when you come to the NCI holding the 30 percent belongs to them you have to give to them now they also partake in the post acquisition profit movement because that belongs to the other investors of the entity so in this case it's going to be the same hundred minus the 50 multiplied by 30 percent because we've taken 70 percent to here the 15 must come here so their holdings will now be 50 in total so once you've determined all these values you can proceed to prepare your consolidated financial statement so quickly let's start our consolidated financial statement here on this column ignore the size of the board so let's write our good book over here to be three four five three four five so assuming that, let me just bring this, assuming that NCI partakes in good goal, it would have been the affair value, and then the post acquisition movement, the profit movement will come. And then if there's any impairment on good goal, I'll feel there, it affects them, it will also come here. Another thing that comes here is uh, on realized profit, depending on who is selling to who, or who owns the unrealized profit and the account it will affect. So subsequently, we'll look at all those uh, technicalities and we can prepare a full statement or a full consolidated statement afterwards. All right, so the name is P Group. P Group <clears throat> Consolidated. So Consolidated Statement of Financial Position. Financial. Position asset. So asset 31st of 12 2021. So this is a few. So first thing first, we can bring two columns over here. So our good will comes. Our good will comes, which is in the question we had three, four, five. So we go according to how um, statement of financial position was presented. So here after the, so remember that the investment in cost in the question will not come. In the consolidation, it will not come because it is, something you have to eliminate it. You have to take it off. Now the other thing is other assets. So the other assets, we add both the parent and the what the subsidiary. So the parent was 500, while the subsidiary was 350. So this gives us, so we can send this one here, 3, 4, 5. So this plus this will give us 8, 850. 8, so we sum this up to get 1195. So that becomes the total assets over here. Then we come to equity and liability. Equity and liability. So equity first, equity first. So here you have what you call um, share capital. So the share capital here, please, will only be that of the parent. The share capital must only be that of the parent, not the subsidiary, because we have acquired that of the sub subsidiary. So the share capital here must be that of the parent. So in this case, the parent share capital was 100. And then we have retained earnings. So this is going to be retained earnings we have calculated. The retained earnings we have calculated, but not the one in the statement of financial position. So the one we have calculated was 685. So we bring it over here. So we sum this up to get 985. And then we add NCI holdings to it. NCI holdings, we add it to it. And in this case, it was 60. 60. So this is going to give us uh, 1045. 1045. Now we add, we have current liabilities in the question. So we have current 
liabilities current liabilities that of the parent was 200 and that of the subsidiary was 150 so plus 150 we add so you can see that we have added the light items so here we give it 350 350 so i think my computations was wrong earlier so if you do the correction it's not 97 so if you do it very well you get uh, 1195 as 1195 so this is basically a simple consolidation so subsequently we are going to look at purchase consideration we will look at intergroup transactions and we will look at other relevant information that we need to prepare a full statement of financial product we can take a, a deep or a detailed question from there so but this one is a simple consolidation remember that we have what we call complex structure we have what we call an associate we have what we call joint arrangement. We will take it a bit by bit, and by the end of everything, you comprehend all the skills, all the knowledge, all the concepts and principles that you will need in preparation and presentation of what consolidated financial statements. Thank you. Please, if you have any question, you can leave it at the comment section, or you can send them to our email, which will be provided at the end of the video. Remember that the question. Uh, link will be at the video description and you can get access to it and then you can follow the solution judiciously. Thank you.